If you have a Bible, if you would, take it and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We are in a uh, verse-by-verse series through this book that starts today. Uh, last Sunday, we had the opportunity to kind of get a kind of get a feel and the flavor of the book um, as Pastor Joe opened up an overview of the text. And today, as we're considering our theme of hold fast, you you may already know this. This kind of comes from a kind of nautical origins. It's really a Dutch phrase that really would be, I guess, first uttered in that tongue as hold fast, which means to hold tight. And for a sailor, or anyone that's accustomed to living anywhere near the water, you know it can be very dynamic. Things can change. Things can get stormy. Things can be uncertain. Things can get a little rough. And so sailors would not be given a suggestion. Hey, why don't you try to hold fast? No, they would be given a command. When things were topsy and turvy and uncertain, They would secure the rigging with that, really that order, hold fast. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, as a verb, it means to bear down, stay the course, to continue to believe in or adhere to something as an idea or principle. In fact, sailors, because the letters could go on each knuckle, this is what they would do. So here's what we thought. You know, we typically do bracelets, but today there'll be a tattoo artist out in the parlor. No, can you imagine if we did something like that? No, not doing that. But it was a way for them to remember, hold fast. Well, what's like a synonym? What's another way to say this? Like, stay strong, do what's right. See it through. No surrender. Stay true. Continue to believe. This mindset that this is going to pass. So grit it out. Hold fast. You know, in that context, it was meant to encourage, call, insight, this resolve to grip onto something secure. The ship's rigging. Why? To avoid being swept overboard and from losing stability. You hold fast so that you're not swept over or unstable. And these aren't suggestions. These are orders. Now, as Paul writes this letter to his protege, Timothy, hear me on this. There was a storm not just brewing, but already upon them. What kind of storm? Misinformation, distortion, assumption, misunderstanding. Sound familiar? It's not new. You see, we would call that in the uh, New Testament false teaching. This dynamic, it started in Genesis 3. If you follow this idea of expositional constancy, meaning the first mention of something in Scripture and then seeing its consistency throughout Scripture, in Genesis chapter 3, what did the enemy first seek to do with his first subject, his first victim? Attack the mind. Did God really say? And he still does that today. The better you know the Word of God, the better you'll know how to live the life that God gave you. You'll know what to value and what actually gives an ROI, both here and now. The better you know your Creator, the more you'll enjoy creation. The more you know a good God, the more you'll be able to enjoy the good things He's given you. This is just logical. That's why the enemy, man, if I was your enemy, you know what I would do? I'd flood your mind with so much information, you wouldn't be able to discern truth from error. And I would give you circus and bread, entertainment, and seek to set you on succeeding at things that don't matter. 
That's what I would do. Misdirection. False teaching. Here's what it leads to. Deception. I don't know. I never met anybody who knows that they're deceived. I never have. It always takes someone else to help them see, hey, you're kind of missing it here. The dynamic of being deceived is not something you go, you look in the mirror and go, well, I'm deceived. No, you're fully convinced. But false teaching leads to deception, which leads to weakened faith, which leads to division. The goal is to divide husband and wife, father and son, business partner, church. You know, a divided country, what it needs is a unified church, a people group that recognize the call upon their life and who he is, Jesus, what he's called us to. This is what's going on as Paul is writing to Timothy. False teaching is rampant. Then and now there is this constant and consistent need to do two things. I'll put them in G's. Guard and grow. Guard. Guard against false teaching. If you, how many of you have ever read through a couple of the New Testament books? Like you've read like maybe Galatians or Ephesians or something. Over and over, First John, he's constantly going after false teaching. And you might be thinking, man, that seems like it was a big deal back then. I wonder why they put it in the Bible. It's a big deal now. It's a big deal forever. Genesis 3. See, if I can get this to change, I get this to change. Chuck Smith used to say, the battle between the flesh and the spirit is waged on the warfare of the mind. So, don't you wish there was a church that every single day tried to help you learn God's word? Guard. Guard against false teaching. And grow. Grow in love. Grow in grace. Grow in wisdom and faith and, and patience. Truth. You see, this little letter, there's three themes. Paul to Timothy, three things. Hold fast, Timothy, to sound doctrine. Let's call that truth. Hold fast, Timothy, to godly leadership. We'll just call that leadership. Timothy, hold fast to faithful living. Call that integrity. If you wanted to summarize what Paul is going after, what he hopes to see accomplished, not just written about, not just sung about, not just making t-shirts about. He's calling them. I'm calling you to truth. I'm calling you to leadership. I'm calling you to integrity. You know, I was in Mobile last Sunday. I think it was last Sunday. It's hard to remember everything when you have a sinus infection. I barely remember the ride over here, you know. Um, I think it was last Sunday. I was, uh, you know, and then when we spent some time in God's word there, we talked about the application thereof. Have you heard that joke? It's not my joke. I forget who said it. About the kid that was told to make his bed. Dad tells the kid, make your bed. Clean your room. Comes into the room. The room's not clean. Room, bed's not made. So dad asks an obvious question. Hey, did you hear what I said? He goes, oh, yeah, I heard it. I'm memorizing what you said. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good, but, like, how about we make that bed? How about we clean that room? God, I'm working on it. I'm actually, you know what? Comes back a few minutes later. <laughs> the room's not clean. The bed, no, no, bed's not good. Hey, what's going on? Well, I memorized it in English. Now I'm looking at the language in which you originally spoke, Koine Greek, to find all the nuances. Okay. How about you make that bed, sir? Okay. Comes back a third time. You know the story now. Bed's not made, room's not clean. What's going on? Well, I got a bunch of friends together. We started studying what you said. 
We've written some songs. Or even like, we've got artists now that are like, you know, they're, they're doing these songs, make your bed, clean your room, make your bed, clean. They're touring the country, telling other kids about it. How about, how about you make the bed? How about you clean the room? Do you see the parallels of what happens in 21st century church? That like sometimes he just wants the bed made, he wants the room clean. Man, I can spit it back to you in New King James ESV or New Living if you like, but is the bed made? Is the room clean? Truth, integrity, leadership. That's what this book is after. And he's saying, I want you to hold fast. Hold fast to these things. Now, there's a hinge point. There's a center to those spokes. It rhymes with Jesus. Do you know what it is? Yeah, it's Jesus. So if you'll just stop trying to be like Jesus and just like Jesus, you'll find that you end up becoming like Jesus. That's how that works. You'll see leadership. You'll see integrity. You'll see character. You'll see truth. Have it stay. In this time this morning that we have afforded to us, let's look at verses 1 through 11 with this concept, with this paradigm, with this filter, with this focus. Hold fast, verse 1 and 2, to the call and to the command of God on your life. That's what we're going to see in verses 1 and 2. This isn't to Timothy. I'm going ahead and giving you the application for your life. We'll, we'll break it down in just a second, but here's the first thing you're going to see. Hold fast to the call on your life, the command that God's put on your life. Number 2, verses 3 through 7. Hold fast to the timing of God in your life and the truth of God's word. In verses 8 through 11, hold fast to the grace of God upon your life through the gospel. Father, I ask with my challenges and limitations and just grossness, I guess, um, Lord, that you would just allow me to serve well and help people to hear your word. Lord, may we glorify you in all that we do. I just thank you, Lord, for the gift of October 20th, 2024. It's not been afforded to some of our friends and family. So hope it be stewarded well by us. Lord, we love you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read from a Thought for Thought translation because I find it to be helpful. Called New Living. Uh, verse 1 and 2. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Appointed by the command of God, our Savior in Christ Jesus, who gives us hope. I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. Now may God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. My takeaway here, and let me explain it, is hold fast to the call and command of God on your life. See, Paul's following a very normal thing, customary in the first century for a letter. Any guys ever get a text message from a number and then there's a lot of text and you don't know that number? You ever, has that ever happened to you? You ever had a phone during the election season? Like, like you get a text, comes from a number you don't know. You know what I do? Delete and report as junk. Um, here's what I do. Sometimes I write a text to someone that I'm not yet connected to, but have been connected to by another. And so I'll write, hey, fill in the blank name. This is Neil. This is how we're connected, fill in the blank, be it church or whatever the connection point is. You have six kids too, hello? Like whatever the connection point is. Um, I say my name right off the bat because, you know, like if you have a lot to say, you have to scroll. Well, did you know that these words were not written on pages that were bound. It was a scroll. So like when Paul's first writing, he identifies himself. Hello, Timothy. This is Paul. It's a customary thing to do. We don't always do that in emails nowadays. Sometimes you do. If it's a long email, like they're never going to read this. Let me make sure I know who it's coming from. Um, he identifies, but here's, I, I, I mean, when I read, it's interesting. It's like he lays down his business card. This is Paul. Wabam, apostle. Like he lays out his credentials. Can you imagine meeting someone at church? Like, hello, my name is Jerry. I have an MBA. 
well, great, Jerry. Talk to you never. You know what I mean? Like when you meet someone like that, you'll just be like, what? Why did you just let, tell me who, what your accomplishments are? Like right off the bat. That's just odd. Why would, why would he do that? It's kind of intense. Paul, an apostle of... Does Timothy not know who Paul is? Of course he does. Why is he doing this? Number one, it's indicative that this letter was more than to just Timothy... But there's something being said here. Apostle, the Greek word apostolos, we more like transmit than translate in English. It means someone who is sent, an ambassador, a messenger. Now, how did Paul get this title? Schoolofapprenticeship.com? Did he wake up one day and go, I don't know, a barista, a carpet maker, cabinet maker? Now, I'll be an apostle. That's what I'm going for. In the New King James, it says, Paul, by the commandment of God. The English Standard Version says, by the command of God. That's intense language. Where does he get this intensity from? Let me put Acts chapter 13 up on the screen. Here's where he gets it from. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Don't miss who was there. Prophets and teachers. And he names some of these people. Barnabas, Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of the Cyrene, Manian, who was actually brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. This is Saul. Saul. Paul, before he changed his name. Listen to what they're doing. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them to. Look what happened. Having fasted and prayed, they ordained them, laid hands on them, sent them away. This is the first ordination service in the New Testament we see. Paul has this commandment, this calling given to him. How does it happen? You know, I moved back to Gulf Breeze for the second time in 2005 from Santa Barbara. And uh, I moved here uh, on a Wednesday. Met a girl named Cecilia on a Friday. A couple months later, I get a call from a guy named John Corson. He calls and says, hey, Neil, got your letter. I'd written him a letter when I lived in Santa Barbara. I'd like to invite you to move to Oregon and attend a training school for pastors. And I thought, hmm. And I said, no, thank you. And he said, what? What about your letter? I said, well, I moved to Florida. I met this girl. Uh, She may not still be around if I go to Oregon. And I got a lease agreement. I got a car payment. I got a cell phone bill I got to pay. I got a job. I can't just go with you to Oregon. What is this? I can't do that. Thank you, but no thank you, sir. God bless you. Um, Hung up. I didn't think anything else about it. My dad, I don't know how he heard about this, but later my dad, he said, hey, Neil, I'm going to talk to you. It's okay. Hey, I heard John Corson called you. Yeah, he did. How'd you know that? Well, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, What did he want? Well, he wants me to move to Oregon, be a part of this three-month discipleship school. I can't take a laptop. I can't even take a phone. It's like meant to be kind of like this thing where you live in a log cabin, and there's 12 other guys. They got their own cabin, and you spend six hours a day, six days a week with John, just learning from him about what ministry was, I guess. And you told him no. So yeah, I told him no. Um, He said, Neil, let me share something with you. Um, When John Corson calls you to disciple you, the answer is yes. I'm like, oh, well, Dad, I mean, I'm not just doing it because I met a girl. I said, I have a lease agreement. You know, I have a car payment. I can't just abdicate life's responsibilities because John Corson calls. He goes, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you write a letter to individuals that you're connected to, friends and family and whoever? Just let them know about this opportunity, what it would cost for you to participate in this. Maybe they'll support it. And if God provides, you should probably go. 
but I won't keep a job for you. Hey, that's fair. I don't think you should. Um, all right, I'll write that letter. Well, the resources come in. And while I live in Oregon, I had a couple of questions I was trying to figure out. Am I a pastor just because my dad's a pastor? Like, that was one question. And then another question. What about this girl named Cece? Should I keep pursuing her? And another question. Should I move to Santa Barbara or should I stay in Florida? So I remember sitting on a bench at this place called the Mountaintop in Applegate, Oregon. And I was asking John these questions. And I think I've shared one of the answers to those questions with you before. Where I said, am I just doing this because my dad's a plumber? You know what I mean? Like, am I just a plumber? Cause am I a pastor because my dad's a pastor? And he said, you know, maybe you've heard this. Neil, did you have any control over to whom you were born, when you were born, where you were born? Obviously not. Does God? Obviously so. Well, perhaps you're not a pastor because you're a pastor's kid. Perhaps you're a pastor's kid because he's called you to be a pastor. What better place to train than to grow with it and to see it for what it is? Well, that's a good idea. Good, good play on words there, John. That's what I thought. Um, so what about my other questions? What about this girl? So I can't, you know, date her for a year. Then you'll know. So a whole year? So yeah, you date her for a year. Because he said some girls and some boys get sad. So <laughs> seasonal affective disorder. He's from Oregon. If you've ever been up there, it like gets gray. So they're used to that. Like when it gets, you know, people's attitude changes when holidays hit or when you go spend some time with someone like, whoa, that's what life is like for you. So, okay, that's good advice. Okay, a last question. Santa Barbara or Florida? Do I work with this guy, named a person, or do I kind of stay with my dad? That's what he said. He said, uh, God will give you a third option. That sounds just like a Corsonism. He told me nothing. You know what I mean? Like, he didn't answer my question. And uh, I'm glad he didn't answer my question because I had to make a decision by faith that I would own. And I thought, well, I'm going to move back to Florida. I'm going to date Cece and just see where life goes, I guess. And then these eight people from Destin kept calling. And I spent 10 years of my life serving there, helping see four other churches get started in that area. And um, that was my third option. And this is what I'm trying to share with you. You and I have something in common, and we don't. This is what we have in common, a static calling, a static command. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You and I share that. That's on all, both of us. Uh, be loving. Love one another. That's on both of us. Uh, then I also think there's dynamic callings that we don't share. Um, I, I, I don't know your mama or your auntie or your cousins. I didn't grow up with them. I, don't, I'm not, I can't do everything that you can do. Some of you guys are gifted to do things I'll never be able to do. Some of you guys like college football. God bless you. I could care less. Like there's just different interests, different uh, wirings. You see, we do have this in common, CBS. We were conceived, born, and shaped. Shaped by the family you're born into, the stories you were sold, and the culture you're in. And I think God uses those things for a dynamic calling upon your life. Paul spent some time in the spiritual places. He's with prophets and teachers. He's just radically gotten saved. And what happens as they're praying, as they're fasting, God speaks through a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Separate Paul, Saul at the time, and Barnabas to me for the work they have. Listen, here's what I want to say. There is a call and a command on your life that we share. Where do we find that? Right here. How do you find that unique calling? The girl to marry, the job, to move, to not move. You do what you know to do, and then God will take care of what you don't know. When you do what you know to do, I think God will show you what you don't know. That's what I think. You don't find your calling. Your calling finds you. As you're just serving the Lord. That's what they're doing in Acts 13. As you're just doing the things that are in black and white and red, 
God positions you right where you're supposed to be. And sometimes it's not too far from that apple tree. You ever heard that? The apple falls not far. Like your, your family, the dynamics he's already placed in you. One of my mentors told me this, Neil, when the, when the priests, the Levites, when they were in the temple, God, if you've ever read the Old Testament, he's very intense about what they wear. He wants them to wear linen. Why? So they would not sweat doing God's work. He said one point of application of that, think of it like this. What do you think God wants you to do? What's cool to you? What, what does he bring into your life? Go, man, Lord, I just feel like you've gifted me to do this. I'm not striving I'm not trying to make connections. I'm not trying to manipulate people. You just, you just put me here. Maybe there's some sovereignty in that. See, you're gifted uniquely, and you'll be tested in it. Because the enemy would love for you to ride the bench, not be effective. So he's going to cast fear, doubt, imagination, speculation, worry. He'll put people around you that want to bring you down, not bring you up. You've got to surround yourself with people that help you more dream than be drained. Because God has a calling upon your life. It's static. It's dynamic. And it's easy because life can be hard. It's easy to lose sight of that in face of opposition. But how do you know your calling? Super simple. Get to know the one who calls you. You just get to know him. The more and more you spend time with him, doing the things that he's told you to do, the more he leads and guides and directs. You know, if your car's moving, he can steer it. If it's parked in neutral, saying, God, you know where I sit in church? Tell me what to do. You're going to be sitting there a long time. What you could do is go get some candy for the fall fest. That'll help. That's something God, you know what I mean? Like you could just say, what does God call me to do? Simple stuff. I could be, I could hold the door for someone. Okay. You never know who that person is you're holding the door for. Like, it's not only the right thing to do the right thing. Listen to me. It's the smart thing. The smart thing is to do the right thing. That's why it's the right thing. But it's also the right thing. But those that water shall themselves be watered. Those that give, God gives to those people. And you have been blessed to be a conduit of blessing, not a reservoir. God gives to you so that you can give to others. That's where life is found. That's where living by faith is found. That's when you're alive. You see, there was this calling and command upon Paul's life. You think he really needed to tell Timothy, hey, don't forget I'm an apostle. Is he that insecure at age 60? I don't think so. More is caught than taught. He's modeling to him. Hey man, know who you are and hold fast to that. And he tells him something else to hold fast to. Look at verse 3. He says, when I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and to stop. Two things. They both start with S. Stay in Ephesus and stop. Stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Stay. I think you should hold fast to the timing of God in your life. It was hard in Ephesus. It wasn't one church that Paul had Timothy oversee. There were multiple congregations meeting in multiple places. I've been to Ephesus twice. The last time I was there was in January. It's massive. It's in Turkey. It's, it's a beautiful place if you ever get a chance to go see it. But, like, it was a challenge for Tim. There's so much to do. And he had to follow Paul. Like, that's a bummer if you're like Timothy. Like, you're on a Sunday, you teach a message, you go, well, it ain't Paul. You know what I mean? Like, that's tough. There's other things there that are tough. If you dig into this, this passage, there's some like David Guzik who would say, we can infer from everything else that Paul ever wrote to Timothy that there wasn't just this like he had a bad day, hey, just hang in there. But there was like this nagging dynamic every morning he woke up that just felt like, I got to get out of here. Like just this dynamic, it meant it would be better over there. The problem about over there is you take you there. 
Like everywhere you go, there you are. And that can be the problem of just change the zip code. I'm sure things will get better. Nah, because you're bringing you with you. That's the stuff that needs to change. Timothy had a desire to leave. But what, is, what does Paul say? Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. Where has God placed you right now where you're like, man, it would just be better if... Listen to the words of Jesus' half-brother, chapter 1 of the book of James. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, run. Find comfort. No. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. When your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, chapter 5, verse 7, be patient as you wait for the Lord. And as you read through that passage, I'd encourage you to check it out later today. You find this dynamic that God often works in the staying, in the waiting. The Bible's full of examples of people who wait for God's timing. Abraham and Moses, 25 years between the time that the promise of Isaac was given and you hear that little, like he's born. 25 years. Moses, 40 years before delivering Israel out of Egypt. I don't like to wait four minutes for a sausage biscuit. 40 years waiting, waiting. David, the king, bad leadership in place. Israel's being impacted by Saul's dynamics. So they, he anoints King David by Samuel, 15 years until he actually becomes king after he's anointed. Jesus, I don't know anybody that had a better birth announcement than Jesus. Angels, glory to God in the highest. It's pretty powerful. 30 years. 30 years till his public ministry began. Paul urged Timothy to stay. Hold fast to the timing of God in your life. You know what helps with that? Community. Because when you're isolated... Four days can feel like four years. You know what helps with that? Serving others. You know what helps with that? Trusting God. God, you've heard me say this before. Think of it this way. He's like in the drone above space and time. You and I are a little bit more like ant drones, just what's right in front of us. I don't know that I would always ask the other drones. What do you think? Community helps, but he's the one that sees. And you have no clue what God is ultimately doing through everything in your life. Trust him. Trust him. God, you're working out your timing. Today I can focus on this. I can trust you with anything else you've got. Paul urged Timothy to stay and to stop. Stop right where he was. The false teaching. You ever been in a situation where gossip comes up? There's your calling. Stop it. Like, kill it before it keeps moving. God has given us his word. There's a standard for truth. And if you look at Galatians, we'll put it up on the screen, chapter 1, verse 6. They very quickly turned away from the truth. If you look at the book of Jude, verse 3. There was this dynamic where he's like, I, I can't wait to get to you to talk about all these other things, but I, I have to write something else urging you to defend the faith. There, there's so much going on. you got to stop those. Why? Look at verse 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. If you're there, let me know by saying hold fast. Okay, verse 4 of chapter 1, he says, Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. You ever been around people that are like, well, I think, well, I think, well, I think, well, I think. I remember in a conversation with God one time, not audible, but just a prayer. I think God told me, Neil, I don't really care what you think. I just tell people my word. Speculations become distractions that don't have a power to change your life. The word of God does. 
So in verses 4 and 5, we see the fruit, the result, the impact of the Word of God in your life. You saw it in verse 4, a life of faith in God. But look at verse 5. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be boring people. No. Would be filled with love. How many pop songs are written on love? That's what pop culture wants. The purpose of my instruction is that believers would be filled with love. You mean if I were to live the Bible, I would get what the world craves? I, I, yeah. Love. He goes on to say, from a pure heart. And you know what it's like to look in the mirror and not hate the person that looks back at you? To have a clear conscience? He said, that's what it's after. That's the, that's the instruction. That's the purpose. Genuine faith. You know, the goal is not always to be right. Hey, what do you mean by that? I've met so many people in my life, interacted with so many people that are doctrinal and dead, that are right, but there's something wrong in the right. They're porcupines, lots of points, no friends, you know, always pointing out what's wrong. The goal of instruction. You want to know someone that really knows their Bible? They live by faith, not by clarity. 21st century human beings are owned by the need for constant clarity. God wants you to take a step of faith. They're filled with love. That's that someone that knows the Bible. That's actually doing it. They're filled with love. They walk by faith. There's a clear conscience. There's a pure heart. They don't live by analytics. Analytics are helpful tools, but terrible masters. They're not filled with judgment. If you make a misstep or you miss a, you know, oh man, I tried to get there, but you're done. No. There's grace, there's mercy. That's how he opened up the letter. I'm writing to you, my true son in the faith. May God, our Father in Christ Jesus, Christ, give you grace and mercy and peace. Who couldn't do with a little more mercy? You see, some were not living that way. That's why he mentions in verse 6 of chapter 1, look at it there with me, some have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and they spend their time in meaningless discussions. Facebook. They want to be known as teachers of the law, of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. He's speaking about Judaizers. Look, let me show you Acts 15. When Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you're circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. There are those that are adding to the gospel. Do, 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 do. No, the gospel is that it's done. Jesus hanging on the cross saying, it is finished. And Paul highlights the importance of sound doctrine. You see, the early church was vulnerable to false teachings. Please hear me on this. Even though I sound like a squeaky Barry White. The early church was vulnerable to false teaching. So am I. So are you. So are we. You've got to know this. And not just know this, but have it translated in a life that looks like love and faith and patience and forgiveness. Bitterness, bitterness, unforgiveness, grudge holding is like you taking the, the breastplate of righteousness off your heart and saying, enemy, have at it. Get a foothold. You got to let it go. Someone once told me, Neil, if the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't wash away the sins of that person that hurt you, what makes you think it washes away your own? You got to let it go. Walk in freedom. See, sound doctrine doesn't just fill our minds with knowledge, it tra transforms our lives. 
creates this dynamic where you actually walk by faith. Let me ask you a question. Part of the answer is yes, because you're here. But do you have a plan to feed yourself sound doctrine? Because if you don't, false teaching will creep in. It's the way it works. You know that with anything that's effective, schedule it. Schedule it, and then measure it, evaluate it. It's the only way you're going to get results. Do you have a plan for this? Not just to make money, but to grow your spirit, to fortify your family, to walk by faith. In a world where we can consume endless content, we must be discerning and hold fast to the timing of God and the truth of God's word. Last point, hold fast to the grace of God upon your life through the gospel is found in verses 8 through 11. Let me read it to you. Again, this is coming from the New Living Translation. Verse 8, he says, We know that the law is good when it's used correctly. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It's for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their mother or father or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral, who practice homosexuality, or slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. Paul talks about the law here. He says it's good if it's used correctly, but you got to understand something. It's not meant for the righteous. It's, not for the, it's for the lawbreakers, the, re, the rebels. See, his list here, I don't want to read it again. I mean, it's inclusive and intensive. He lists things that contrast with wholesome teaching. He's holding this, verse 8, 9, and 10, in juxtaposition to verse 11. God never gave the law for salvation. Let me read Romans 3.20. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. There was a group 15 years ago that said, man, Jesus, he lived Torah. So if you really want to live the way of Jesus, you've got to follow your Hebraic roots. That is a degree off from a life of grace. Hold fast to the grace of God. Constantly grip the gospel every single day. The law shows us our need for a savior. And Jesus, Jesus, he meets that need. Our obedience doesn't save us. It's the grace of God. Let me share something with you by way of video that, that really drives this home from another Calvary Chapel pastor in Oregon. Let's roll that clip real quick. Very common. I know that we're not saved by keeping the law, but instead we're saved by grace through faith. But... If I love God, shouldn't I strive to obey the law in my life? I get that one a lot. And it's an interesting question. And I think it's a valid question. I think it's probably an important question. And then, you know, the person who's writing it will usually go on to quote some elements of the law or the Ten Commandments and say, you know, like, you know, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not bear false witness, uh, you shall not steal or something like that. And they'll say, you know, isn't, isn't that stuff I'm supposed to strive after? in order to, to please God and, 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 and that sort of thing. And honestly, the, the question, it sounds as if you should say yes. <laughs> when they ask it that way, it sounds like you should respond by saying, well, yes, if, if you understand that you're not saved through the law, then it's okay to follow the law and keep those elements of the law, you know, because it's a good thing and da, 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 da. But that approach... That approach of, by a Christian fails to fully understand what God has done in the life of the believer in order that you might live a Christ-like life. Because you see, that position puts emphasis on obedience to a command rather than a yielding of the life to the Spirit, which is what we are called to do. We are not called to keep a command. We are called to yield to a God who now lives within us. People, 
the one who spoke from Mount Sinai and echoed the Ten Commandments down to the hearing nation of Israel now lives in you. Do you understand how much more superior that is to have the lawgiver living in you rather than to be following these rules written on stone tablets? Because as you yield to the work of the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is not just in there communicating righteousness, he is inside of you empowering you to live for righteousness. And that's something the law was never intended to do. The law cannot empower you to live for Jesus Christ. It was never meant to. It is through the Holy Spirit we are empowered. And the Holy Spirit is the lawgiver. He is now communicating his law in your heart. And it's no longer, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's, I don't want to displease my Lord. I don't want to do that. He, he has impacted my will. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It is God who works in you. It's not you looking at a law engraved on stone and going, I've got to do that. It is God who works in you. And he's doing a good work. If we would but yield to that work, resisting sin, yielding to the Spirit, and saying, God, I can't do this apart from you. I can't live this life you've called me to live. I can't do this. You've got to strengthen me. You've got to be the strength of my life, that I might live this life for you. So you need to understand that between the command and the power of the indwelling spirit, there's, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. What you have as a believer is so much more incredibly superior and better than the law. It's beyond compare. It's just totally beyond. And that's why I tell people, if, you know, if you're a Christian and you're attempting to live according to the law, even if you know and understand that that law can't save you, if you're trying to live according to that law, you're still shortchanging your life. You're shortchanging yourself from living the life that God wants you to live. And it's still a misuse of the law. So don't look to the law, right? Don't look to the law, people. Look to the power of the Spirit the lawgiver who lives in your heart by faith and who is constantly, daily communicating the righteousness of God in your heart. Amen? Amen. Paul is urging Timothy to hold fast to the grace that's available to us through the gospel. This is the theme that's going to run above, if you want to call it the meta-narrative. Yeah, we see about leadership and integrity character, all these things. Where does that come from? Christ in you. That's your hope of glory. A vibrant relationship with God is available to you. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is surrender. Admit that you need him. Believe in Jesus and confess him as Lord. Do that every day. Preach the gospel to yourself and then live by his grace. 